Hi everybody, and welcome to What's It About? This is that Wednesday series where we go through different parts of our faith, or of our religion, of our church, even our building, and we talk about where things came from, what they point uh, toward for us today as modern Christians, and kind of how they fit into the big picture of religion. So today is one I'm really excited about. I have notes. Uh, today we're going to talk about vestments, or the things that we wear in worship. Um, you probably have noticed that I wear a few different things than maybe some other Methodist pastors that you have seen. Um, I'm kind of a, a strange, unique spirituality and combination of some different denominations. And one of the ways that comes out is in the way I dress. So welcome to my closet here in my office. Uh, I'm going to go through as many of these as I can and just kind of tell you what each one is, where it comes from, when you might see it in worship, and what to look for as we go about. So let's start with this very first one. This is one that you are probably very familiar with in United Methodism. This is a black pulpit gown or Geneva gown is what it's called. Mine here has some uh, uh, velvet um, strip panels on it, but not all of them do, of course. Uh, this is the pulpit gown. Um, the pulpit gown has its history really in the Protestant Reformation. So if you recall, one of the great issues over the Protestant and Catholic split in the 1500s was that priests, bishops, and deacons, the clergy, were treated significantly better than everyone else in the church. They were treated kind of like little mini kings or little mini dukes or princes uh, and had all of the luxury in the world. One of the things that the Protestants were uh, rebelling against that, pushing back on that, said, no, we're all equal, so we don't need to have any special elaborate clothing for our pastors. Um, instead, they can kind of dress like the laity. Well, not street clothes, but, but non-ordained persons. And the Geneva gown was already in use in academia. So professors, uh, teachers, even students would wear these while they're in class. Um, so this was already in practice. So it did not denote any special spiritual status for clergy. It just noted that you were uh, an academic. And so you would, uh, you know, teach and preach in that vestment, that gown. This went away in the 1900s for the most part, um, due to the movement in America, at least, called revivalism. Uh, so we saw a, a, a push toward to more equalization of our lay members and our clergy. Um, so at that point you saw really robes in general kind of go away. Let's move on to this next one. This one you may not be as familiar with. It's also black like the pulpit gown, but it's a little bit more form-fitting and kind of fastens here along the side. This is called a cassock, a cassock. And a cassock has its history, uh, as most of our church stuff does, in ancient Rome. The cassock was sort of the liturgical um, underwear, if you will, the undergarment. This black cassock, well, ours is black, it wasn't always black, but this black cassock piece was designed to go on the, as the bottom layer for Romans, especially uh, upper class Romans. So this would be the bottom piece, and then there would be a various accoutrement of things over the top. Um, this hasn't always also been floor length or ankle length as, uh, as they are today. Um, these originally were a little bit shorter, maybe ankle, mid-calf, maybe knee, knee even. Um, but there was a modesty uh, movement uh, in, in after the turn of the millennia, and those began to be longer and longer. And now, cassocks are almost always floor length. So, you probably won't see me in the cassock much, just because it's usually covered by other stuff, but it is almost always there. The next piece is one of those things that would have been over top. Now, this is called an alb, A-L-B, an alb. Uh, and it is almost always white or undyed, so it could be kind of a grainy color. Um, and it was worn over top of this liturgical underwear, if you will, uh, the cassock. And the alb um, what was also a part of Greco-Roman wear. So this was kind of your, some of your street clothes that went over your uh, liturgical underwear. Uh, this was the long, a long tunic. A long tunic that was worn over top of that and bound at the waist by a belt or a cincture or a rope in my case. So there's a variety of things that you could uh, to bind your, your owl with. It is almost always white or undyed, like I said, because that represents our purity uh, before God. Uh, and the fact that as Christians and our baptized Christians, we claim a, a spiritual cleansing. Uh, and so we wear white. 
that is, is undyed or pure for purity. Now, albs got a little tiring at some point. Um, albs were clunky. These tunics, uh, they, they're heavy. They were expensive. They're long. So eventually, we move to a sort of overpiece that's a little bit lighter, right? You see the opening at the top. It's not quite floor length or ankle length. It kind of hits right below the knees, maybe. This is called a surplus, and it's a modified version of an alb. Um, they come in different styles. Now, uh, in general, um, the one that I wear the most is an Anglican cassock. Um, it's got the big, long, poofy wizard sleeves, right? Uh, from our Anglican uh, academic institutions. And then this is called the yoke. It's a round yoke that, uh, that frames out the, the head hole. You can also get these a little shorter. Roman Catholics typically wear them a little shorter, right below the waist. Um, and oftentimes those aren't round like mine, uh, but they're kind of square, a square yoke. So that's a, a, um, a surplus, and that goes over top of a cassock. Now, the next piece here, I want to talk about are stoles. You've probably seen most Christian clergy in a stole. A stole, uh, I'll use this one here, this is one of mine. A stole uh, originated as sort of a, a, a scarf, uh, and it had quite a function. You know, actually, I'm going to start with a different one. I have borrowed one of Pastor Mary's stoles. This is a deacon stole. Now, you can sum up what this is really fast. How many of you have been in the kitchen working and you're doing dishes or whatever and you grab your um, dish towel, your cloth, you throw it over your shoulder, you get back to work. That way, you know, you can wipe your hands, you can wipe your mouth, you can wipe something. It's always right there at your side. Clergy stoles started no differently. Um, deacons, remember, were originally the worker bees of the church. They were the ones that did the hands-on ministry with parishioners or, or community members because bishops were often so busy. So they would, symbolically, of course, take the stole, throw it over their shoulder, so that when they were serving communion, baptizing, washing feet, they always had something they could clean or wipe with. Now, the church said, okay, deacons need that, but so do bishops and so do priests. So we kind of developed a different version of it. We unhooked it from the side here and it goes over the back and lays down in front. Nowadays, this is what you find for a priest or bishop stole. We call that a presbyter stole. Um, but you might see it in, in um, different styles uh, depending on time or location or where you were. Um, for example, this has historically been how bishops wear stoles. Priests often cross them in front of themselves and fasten. You don't see that as much anymore, of course. That's kind of outdated at this point. Uh, but it is a practice if you ever do see it. So those are stoles. Hang in me. I got two more there, two more uh, vestments for us. This next one, you probably don't see this one very much. This is called a scapular. It lays over the front and back uh, of a person wearing it, clergy or lady, either one. This one derives from monks or nuns, a monastic vestment. This is a liturgical apron. So monks and nuns, remember, had community work they would do. That included gardening, farming, how, um, uh, animal livestock rearing. So there was all kinds of stuff that lended monks and nuns to get dirty. So they covered it up with a scapular. I have them in different colors. Uh, but they usually went with whatever the, uh, the undergarment was, the same color as the undergarment. And that's a derivative of a monastic uh, vestment. So the last one we have for today, this is called a chasuble. A chasuble, like other things, has its history in Greco-Roman culture, Roman life in particular. Um, this was originally called a casula in, in Latin, uh, which means a little house. Um, a teeny little house. So this was sort of a ceremonial, symbolic vestment with a hole, you know, here for the head um, that denoted that you were special of some kind. You were a civil leader. You were a church leader. Um, you were elected an elected official. So, so chasubles kind of developed as a way to denote rank. What it evolved into is a, a vestment for serving communion, presiding at the table, uh, creating with God and the Holy Spirit the sacrament that we call Holy Communion. Um, this ultimately 
what was another form of replacement for the owl, the tunic. The, the uh, heavy, heavy, hard to keep up with tunic. The chasuble kind of replaced that. So the tunic went out of style. So we went to wearing this on the top. These typically now go with all of the seasons, uh, all the different colors for church. And you'll find stoles underneath these, uh, which we've got here, of course. So I hope that that wall along video, I hope that that helps you understand and see just kind of how stole our vestments play into our worship. And they always point us back to God, but not to us. So I hope you have a great week and I look forward to seeing you Sunday. Bye-bye.